Good morning. Everybody doing okay? You guys good? Good, good. Okay, so if you weren't here last week, we, we've been doing the Gospel of John. We finished up the third chapter. And again, if you weren't here, it ended. Uh, it, it's pretty heavy. It talks about the end of chapter three that if we accept Jesus, basically if we have a relationship with Jesus, we inherit eternal life. But if we reject that relationship with Jesus, that we have to face the, the, the wrath of God. Pretty, pretty heavy thing to talk about. So because it was so heavy last weekend, I, um, I feel like I owe this to you. So a string walks into a bar. And so, yeah. String walks into a bar, walks up to the bartender, orders a milk, because that's what strings do in bars, and walked up and he said, um, hey, bartender, I just want a glass of milk. And the bartender goes, I'm sorry, man, we don't, we don't serve strings in this bar. And he's like, okay. So he leaves the bar. He's really, really frustrated. He really wants that glass of milk. He goes across the street to a clothing store, buys a top hat, a monocle, you know, a little bow tie, um, goes back into the bar. <laughs> And goes, uh, hello, chap, I, I just want to get a, that's my best British accent. I, I just, <laughs> I want to order a, a glass of milk. And the bartender goes, oh, of course, sir. And starts to pour the milk. And right before he hands it to him, he goes, wait a second. You're that straw that just came in here. I told you we don't, we don't serve straws. Straws, strings. And they do serve straws. They don't serve strings. We don't serve strings in this bar. So the string goes out again. This time he's super frustrated goes into an alleyway near the bar, starts rubbing his body up against the brick wall, messing his hair up, kind of twisting himself all around, and again, goes back to the wall, scrapes himself up against the wall a little bit more, storms back into the bar, sits down at the, it, 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 the, it, on the stool and says, hey, I need a glass of milk. And the guy goes, man, you are that same string that keeps, keeps coming in here, aren't you? And he goes, no, 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 I'm afraid not. Yes. Those of you that didn't laugh about halfway through the sermon, you'll be like, oh. <laughs> Afraid not. It's brilliant. It's as good as it gets, guys. So, again, last week was heavy. This week we are in chapter four, and we are going to do um, one of my favorite stories in, in the entire Bible. And I think one of the reasons why I love the story of the woman at the well so much is because I think we see the character and nature of God almost more clearly and more practically in chapter four of the Gospel of John than, than almost anywhere else in the entire Bible. It's quite beautiful, it's quite wonderful. And we all kind of fit into this story a little bit. So here's what we're gonna talk about today. We're not gonna do all of chapter four. Uh, we'll do about 70% of it, we'll almost get through with it. But we're gonna land on this question. And this question works on two different levels. The first way this question works is, are we willing to get uncomfortable ourselves with God? What I mean by that is, are we willing to be completely exposed and transparent and vulnerable when it comes to our relationship with God? That's the first question. The second question is the same question, but, but from a different perspective. Are we willing to get uncomfortable when it comes to other people? Are we willing to engage people that are very, very different from us, think very different than us? Are we willing to get uncomfortable and hopefully build relationships with other people so they can get to know Jesus Christ the way we have a relationship with Jesus Christ, okay? So, should've got a notes handout when you came in. Everything I'm gonna say will be in there. Um, if you have a Bible, we're in the New Testament, Gospel of John written in the first century by one of the 12 disciples, one of the closest of the 12 disciples to Jesus. Everything will be on the screens, and if you have a smartphone, the Experience Community app, and we should be in good shape. Got a lot of ground to cover, so let me pray. We'll jump into this, and um, we'll talk about being uncomfortable a little bit at the end, right? Let me pray. Father God, we love you. Lord, we thank you. I thank you for everyone in this room this morning. I thank you, God, that we have the freedom and the opportunity to come in here and to worship you and, and to break open the word and talk about it. I pray, Lord, that you just keep your hand on our church this morning. We pray not only for our church, we pray for every single church in our city, pray for our other campuses and the churches in those cities, God, and we pray for the wonderful nonprofits that we're working with, and God, and ultimately, we just pray that everything we do this morning, that it honors you and brings more attention to you and brings us closer to you. Lord, we love you, we thank you, we praise you. 
Pray all these things in your son's name, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Great story. If you've never heard it, absolutely fabulous. Chapter four of John, I'm gonna read some, and then I'll go back and we'll, we'll break it down. When Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard he was making and baptizing more disciples than John, though Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were, he left Judea and he went again to Galilee. He had to travel through Samaria, so he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the property that Jacob had given his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, worn out from his journey, sat down at the well. It was about noon. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Give me a drink, Jesus said to her, because his disciples had gone into town to buy food. How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? She asked him, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered, if you knew the gift of God and who is saying to you, give me a drink, you would ask him and he would give you living water. Sir, said the woman, you don't even have a bucket and the well is deep. So where do you get this living water? You aren't greater than our father Jacob, are you? He gave us the well and drank from it himself and so did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said, everyone who drinks from this water will get thirsty again. But whoever drinks from the water that I will give him will never get thirsty again. In fact, the water that I will give him will become a well of water springing up in him for eternal life. So the Pharisees, if you have not been here, the Pharisees are kind of the bad guys. And so the popularity of Jesus is starting to get, to get pretty big. So they say John had somewhere in the neighborhood of about 100,000 people that came to him throughout the time he was out there in the desert. That's a, that's a lot of people. Jesus' popularity was starting to eclipse that of John the Baptist, and that made the religious leaders, the, the, the leaders in Jerusalem, anxious. So the Pharisees were coming after him, basically, and Jesus learned of this and took off and went a different direction. Now, when it says that Jesus learned, this is just one of these things I'm throwing out, and I hope this isn't uh, something that confuses anyone. I, I don't know the answer to this. I don't know if the human side of Jesus slowly came, in, came into more and more knowledge as he got older, or if Jesus absolutely knew everything that was going to happen, which is kind of where I lean because the Bible, uh, God asks a lot of questions throughout the Bible that he already knows the answer to. And so maybe that's just John's perspective. Well, Jesus learned they were coming, so he went a different way. I assume Jesus knew everything anyways, but, but, but I, I don't know, right? I don't, I don't know if he grew into that more or not. So another good question is, why did Jesus not baptize well, maybe the answer for this is more than likely the reason why Jesus didn't do the baptizing is maybe that would have put more emphasis on the physical act more than the spiritual transformation that was taking place during a baptism ceremony. So baptism is, is a step that, that all Christians should take out of obedience. But what we, what we have a tendency to do, because we're humans, is we have a tendency to make it more about the water and more about the person baptizing us than what the symbolism of that act actually means. And so maybe Jesus kind of took his hands off of it, let his disciples do it, to show them it's not the water, it's not who's baptizing you, it is God doing a change in us because of our obedience to Jesus Christ. And so maybe that's why Jesus kind of removed himself from that process. And then maybe the third question we kind of have to ask here just at the beginning is, why did he go through Samaria? So to get to, he was leaving Judea, going to Galilee, and to get to that area, the quickest route would not have taken him through Samaria, it would have taken him through an area called Jericho. And so Jesus not only went a longer route, he went through an area where they did not like Jews. And quite frankly, the Jews didn't like Samaritans very much, Either There's a lot of hostility between these two groups of people. Now, they worshiped the same, same God, but they're from geographically different areas. There was a divide that goes back about 800 years from this time. And so, so there was this animosity between these two groups. So Jesus, I assume, 
knew not only that there was going to be a woman at a well in that area that he needed to talk to, and that's not going to, only going to teach her a huge lesson, but all of us a huge lesson through that conversation. Not only that, Jesus understood, listen, that there was animosity amongst believers, and that cannot go unaddressed. So Jesus had to address the rift that were between these two groups of believers, and so he was going to go do that. So again, Jesus was fully God and fully man simultaneously. And the human side of Jesus got tired, got frustrated. He, the, the, now, Jesus never sinned, and that was the divine side of Jesus. But we see he gets tired from his journey. He's been walking a long time, probably talking to a lot of people, ministering, teaching. He's worn out. So they come into this area called Sychar. They come to where Jacob's well was. And if you're interested in the history of that, Genesis chapter 33, and Jesus sits down, it's around noon, and he's gonna rest. And the disciples are gonna go into town and they're gonna grab some food. So this is the hottest part of the day. And on the hottest part of the day, a Samaritan woman comes up to draw water from the well. Now, more than likely, this woman did it at the hottest part of the day because she didn't want to run into anyone. And, and there is Jesus. And not only is Jesus sitting there, Jesus engages her in conversation. This is probably the last thing that this woman wanted at this moment. She just wanted to be left alone, get her water and leave. So here's the interesting thing. For Jesus to engage this woman in conversation would have been extremely controversial. This would have been a, kind of a minor scandal. Now, nowadays, I go to coffee shops as much as I have time to, not as much as I used to, but if I go to a coffee shop and if I'm sitting there, if I'm reading, if I'm studying, or if I'm just, you know, just, just chilling for a minute, having a cup of tea or something, if someone walks in and out and it's a woman that comes to the church, it's not a big deal that we sit and talk for a second. You know, someone may walk by, hey, pastor, good to see you, or hey, Corey, and, and we'll just shoot the breeze for 30 seconds, and they walk on. Not a big deal. In this culture, in Jesus' time, men and women just didn't do that. In public areas like that, you wouldn't be sitting alone with a woman talking. Not only that, this woman was a social outcast. Now, now pardon me for a second. I'm going to say a word that you probably don't want your children saying, but that's why we have Echo and Eon. We would have called this woman a whore or, or a slut. We would have said something very, very derogatory about a woman who was this promiscuous. So not only was Jesus talking to a woman, which was unconventional, he was talking to a woman that, that had a really, really bad reputation. And not only that, she was the wrong skin color. She was the wrong race. So you have someone that's the wrong gender, the wrong sexual lifestyle, and the wrong color, and then you have Jesus, our Lord and Savior, talking to this individual. So the Jews didn't like the Samaritans so much that they weren't even allowed to touch things that were once owned by Samaritans. That's how much of a racial divide there was between these two groups of people. Now, why does all of this matter so much? It matters because Jesus Christ lovingly and truthfully approaches the lowest of the low. And I say that with a little bit of facetiousness, that, that he approaches this woman that would have been considered the worst sinner in society. And he debunks a lot of, of misconceptions about what it means to follow Jesus. The first one that we learn here is that, that, that Christians cannot be racist or sexist. Amen. Now, hold on. People go, well, I've met racist Christians. No, you haven't. You have never met a racist Christian. The reason why I say that is you cannot follow Christ and be a racist. You have never met a sexist Christian. Well, yes, I have. I left the church because of a sexist Christian. No, you didn't. That individual was not a Christian. You cannot follow Christ and degrade the opposite sex. You cannot do that. We are to be loving to all people even the most egregious sinners. And we are to share the truth with even the most egregious sinners without compromising our biblical integrity. That we are to love all people, but we are not to condone or compromise things that are outside of the teachings of this book. 
And so the woman at the well, she could not get past the physical. When I, when I use the word materialistic today, I don't mean that like she felt like she had to wear designer clothes. I mean that, that she couldn't get past the material, what she could see, what she could taste, what she could touch, what she could feel. So this woman couldn't get past her physical problems and the consequences that her physical problems were, were, were giving her in life. But Jesus wasn't there to necessarily fix her physical problems or her temporary problems. Jesus was there to fix her, her permanent problems, her spiritual problems. So she is talking about water, literal water. Jesus is not talking about water at all. The living water he is referring to is the Spirit of God that is freely given to those who choose to follow Jesus Christ. And this spiritual water, this living water, the Holy Spirit, is imperative because we cannot hold on until Jesus returns unless we have the Holy Spirit with us. Amen. And so we are waiting for the physical Jesus to come back, and in the meantime, we have the Spirit to sustain us until he returns for us. So they're talking about two different things. She is talking about the natural. Jesus is talking about the spiritual. And so Jesus' initial question or his initial comments opened up a can of worms, didn't they? It opened up this conversation about personal hurt. It opened up a conversation about racism and generational hatred. It opens up a conversation about sin and repentance, about fulfillment, about salvation. And it just started with Jesus saying, can you give me a drink of water? So here's the thing. This woman showed up, listen, this is so important. This woman showed up to gain something physical by her own abilities. Jesus was offering her something supernatural that she could not achieve with her own abilities. She was looking for something to fulfill her that she could do. And Jesus said, I am offering you fulfillment that you cannot do. I have to do it for you. And the point is this, the metaphor is this, our water never fulfills us. When we are dependent just on the physical to sustain us, we die. Sometimes that is physical. If you have enough promiscuous sex, eventually you're going to contract something that is probably going to take your life or at least make the quality of your life much less. If you are hateful enough and racist enough, you're gonna say enough things to enough people to where someone's eventually going to hurt you or possibly kill you. So sometimes sin leads to physical death, but every time sin always leads to spiritual death. Amen. Our water never fulfills. So in layman's terms, the things we lust for, the, the, the sex, the pleasure, the materialism, the titles, the accolades, the money, the power, the affirmation, the little thumbs or the little hearts or the little thumbs with hearts and people hugging the hearts and thumbs, all that stuff <laughs> will never be enough to satisfy your soul. It will never be enough. Our ways always fail. And the prophet Jeremiah said this, again, hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus and the woman at the well conversation happened. Jeremiah said, this is God speaking through Jeremiah, so this is actually God saying this. For my people have committed two crimes, two evils. They have abandoned me, the fountain of living water, and dug cisterns for themselves, cracked cisterns that can't hold water. Translated, God is saying, you guys have abandoned my way of doing things, created your own way of doing things, and it's broken, and it never holds water. It is never enough. It can never be filled up, okay? That's what this conversation is all about. Sir, the woman said to him, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and come here to draw more water. Go call your husband, he told her, and come back here. I don't have a husband, she answered. You have correctly said I don't have a husband, for you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you've said is true. Sir, the woman replied, I see that you're a prophet. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews say that the place to worship is in Jerusalem. 
Jesus told her, believe me, an hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know because salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Yes, the Father wants such people to worship him. God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. And Jesus said, I, the one speaking to you, am he. That's good stuff, yeah. So, this woman in a lot of ways is very similar to Nicodemus, and she's also not similar to Nicodemus in another way. Similarly to Nicodemus, she was spiritually insecure, she was, she, was, she was materialistic. Again, and I say that, I don't mean that like wanting nice things, but she couldn't get past the physical. She was empty, she was lost. Unlike Nicodemus, she was very, very sarcastic. So when she says right here, um, sir, give me this water, she's being sarcastic. You say you have better water, why don't you get that for me? So I never have to come back to this well ever again. And so Jesus meets that sarcasm with a very sobering statement. Basically says, sure, I'll give you the water. Go get your husband. And at this point, listen, all the metaphors stop. From this point forward, it's very, very, very straightforward. Now listen, in the Bible, there are lots of hyperboles. There are lots of metaphors. There are lots of analogies and parables in the Bible. But when it comes to what is right and wrong, God is crystal clear. Amen. There is no metaphors. There is no beating around the bush. It is very, very direct. Now, when we read the word of God and we are confronted with our, the, the, the truth of what we've done wrong, our sin, we are then at a crossroad. Do I own up to this and say, guilty, I am guilty? Or do we make excuses? Now, this is important. Since the woman said, you're correct, I have been living in sin, that was the green light for Jesus to keep moving forward in this relationship. But if we refuse to own the fact that we have done things wrong, Jesus cannot move forward in our relationship because we're not being honest. But this woman, with all of her faults, she was honest. So here's the thing. Having five husbands and then living with a sixth man that is not your husband, that would have been in their society kind of like a top tier sin. Nowadays, we don't think so much about it because we don't value marriage as much or, or fidelity or any of that stuff. And, and so we don't think about it so much in our culture. There are other sins that we would put kind of as top tier sins. But in their culture, this was a top tier sin. Now, this is interesting. Jesus does not look at sin the way we look at sin. We kind of put it in tears. Now, don't get me wrong. There are parts in the Bible where there are certain sins that the Bible warns us do have greater ramifications on earth. For instance, the Bible says sexual sin does because sexual sin is a sin against yourself, which means there are more ramifications for you on earth. That doesn't mean it can't be forgiven. That doesn't mean we can't change, but there may be long lasting effects of sexual sin. So it's, it's, it's greater maybe on earth, but to God, all sin all sin puts a wedge between us and him. On the same note, all sin can be forgiven. Well, what about the unforgivable sin? The unforgivable sin is when we become so arrogant and hard-hearted that we refuse to ask for forgiveness of sin. So we must be willing. If God sees sin as all thing that separates us from, from him and that all can be forgiven, we have to get out of our comfort zones and have to be willing to minister to the quote unquote worst people in society, regardless of what others think. And we're going to see this. In a, there, there, are some, there, there are some Christians that will hear the kind of people that we allow into this church and they go, liberal, crazy, crazy church over there, the experience. Man, they just let anyone come in those doors. And I'm like, of course we do. What do you think the church is for? That doesn't, listen, that doesn't mean we condone everything that people do that walk in this place. But yes, everyone is welcome in these doors, just like everyone was welcome to come hear the truth from Jesus' mouth. This is how 
it should be, and we should not care so much what others think. Listen, you are not here to impress other people. You are here to make sure that you have God's approval. And if the Bible is correct, which I believe it is, it is not God's will that any go to hell, that none perish. So that means anyone we can build a relationship with and hopefully introduce them to Christ, we need to be doing so. So this woman, and, and, and of course, we would all feel a little embarrassed. She was embarrassed. Her, her, the, the, the kind of verbalization of her sin was now out. And so she, she tries to kind of divert the conversation. Oh, I see that you're a prophet. Oh, and, and by the way, you Jews say that we worship improperly, that we're not allowed. We used to be able to worship here, but now you guys say we have to go to a certain kind of temple and we have to do it over there in Jerusalem. And she tries to change the subject. And she tries to make an excuse as to why she doesn't worship. Well, because I can't travel all the way to Jerusalem. It's a lot like nowadays when we're like, oh, well, I mean, I was out of town. I'm busy. I got stuff to do. The parking, it's hard to get, it's hard to get there. No one complains about parking when you go to a football game, do they? You have to park two miles away, and you walk in the rain, and then you sit out in the snow for four hours at a football game. No one complains. If it's 68 degrees in here instead of 69 degrees, and someone has to walk a little bit further, people are like, oh, I just can't do this. It's gonna, be a, it's gonna be a tough life. Anyways, we tend to, when our sin is brought up, we tend to kind of change the subject. And we tend to make excuses as to why we are sinning. The problem is this, is that when we're face to face to Jesus, he kind of leaves us without excuse. And so we have to own up to it. We have to deal with this. And so Jesus makes it clear. This is very, very important. Jesus makes it clear. He says, look, a time has come where it doesn't matter if you worship on that hill or in that temple or if you dress nice or if you don't dress nice or what kind of music you play or it doesn't matter if it's high church or low church or you'd be considered low church. I don't mean that derogatory. That's what we are, right? We're casual and we don't have liturgy and all that kind of stuff. He says there's going to come a time and it's already come to where it's not about necessarily how you worship the method. What I mean is this, 50 years ago, LED panels didn't exist. This is a different way of presenting the gospel. It's a different method than, than your grandfather uh, when he went to church or, or when your grandmother went to church. They didn't have this method of presenting the gospel. Methods are allowed to change. So if, if you want to go to a church that, that does, um, again, more liturgy or, or they have a priest that dresses a certain way or you have to dress a certain way, that's fine. Method can change. What cannot change is theology. Amen. So we use a different methodology, but we teach the same theology that has been established for the last 2,000 years. So how are we to worship God? We are to worship God in spirit with our hearts, our emotions, our feelings, and we are to balance that by also worshiping God with the truth that is our minds, our intellect, and through the knowledge we have of the word of God. Whenever people say, I just worship God how I want, then you're worshiping God wrong. You have to worship God how he wants, in spirit and in truth. Now, the methodology can change. The theology cannot change. And so I just had to throw this in here because you couldn't write a movie script with this good of a plot twist. So, so after the woman, she does show that she has faith. She is broken, she is sinful, but she says, I know that one day the Savior is gonna come. I know that one day the Savior of my people that's going to restore all things, explain all things, I know one day he's gonna come. Imagine seeing this woman's face when Jesus says, it's me. And you realize that you have been looking into the eyes of God. That is pretty amazing, pretty amazing. You couldn't write a better twist than that. Just then his disciples arrived. They missed the whole thing. And they were, am <laughs> they were amazed that he was talking with a woman. Yet no one said, what do you want? Or why are you talking with her? Then the woman left her water jar, went into town and told the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They left the town and they made their way to him. In the meantime, the disciples kept urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said, I have food to eat that you don't know about. The disciples said to one another, could someone have brought him something to eat? 
My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work, Jesus told them. Don't you say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Listen to what I'm telling you. Open your eyes and look at the fields because they are ready for harvest. The reaper is already receiving pay and gathering fruit for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper can rejoice together. For in this case, the saying is true. One sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap what you didn't labor for. Others have labored and you have benefited from their labor. So when the disciples get back, Jesus is talking to a woman. Again, this would have been extremely controversial, but they dare not say, what are you doing? Why are you talking to her? And that's for a couple of different reasons. One, he was the rabbi. He was the teacher. They're following him. How oftentimes do we ask God, why are you doing it that way when we are supposed to be the students? They didn't ask, why are you doing it this way? Because they respected him, because they loved him, because they trusted him. And obviously something had changed in the woman. She drops her water jar, her jars, and then she runs into town and she starts telling everyone, come meet a man that told me everything I've ever done. Could this be the Messiah? And what we have here is this. We have really our first clear example of someone being born again. I find it remarkable that it was a woman who was the wrong color, who was sexually promiscuous. I find it interesting. This is kind of our first born again experience. Now, Nicodemus and Jesus talked about this, but we didn't see Nicodemus's transformation. We get to see this woman's transformation. And the 12 disciples, when they rolled up, they missed all of that. They didn't get to see any of that. They were just worried about their, their rabbi having enough food to eat. So they said, rabbi, please eat something. We got some food. Let us, let us give you something to eat. And he goes, I have food that you don't know about. And they're kind of like, I mean, what did, what did he, did someone walk, walk by and give him food? How did he get food? And what this is, it's another example of kind of the, the materialism or the spiritual immaturity of the disciples and basically of, of most people around Jesus. So they thought, well, you have, did you hide some food? How did you get some food? And that's not his point. His point is this. What sustains us ultimately is not physical food. It is spiritual food. And, and the point is this. If someone were to walk up to you today and say, I have a loaf of bread that will keep you alive for one more day, or I have the word of God and the knowledge of God and a relationship with God, and you will die today, but it will keep you alive for eternity. Anyone who knows that would say, well, give me the spiritual bread. At least I hope so. Give me the spiritual bread. I want to live forever, not just another day. But how many times, guys, do we buckle to the physical temptations of this world and neglect the thing that gives us eternal life? So here's another side of it. The goal of the church ultimately is not social justice. I believe in social justice. But that is a byproduct of the bigger thing that the church is supposed to do. First and foremost, the Bible says Christ came to save sinners. Well, the point of the church is to feed the poor and to help those that are in need. That's a byproduct. That's a secondary function of the church. I believe we are responsible for that. And I'm going to go ahead and say, and I don't, I don't mean it to be boastfully, you will probably never go to a church that does it more than we do. Amen. But our primary function is the salvation of souls. And as we have opportunity, yes, we meet the physical needs. But if it's between feeding a homeless man or sharing the gospel with the homeless man, share the gospel with the homeless man. Amen. Feed him as well. But you understand what I'm saying. We need spiritual food even more than we need the physical food. So as, you know, as they're talking about food, imagine this. This woman has run into town and maybe people in the distance were starting to come towards Jesus and his disciples. And so now he uses a different food analogy. He says, you guys say that the harvest is four months in the future. Look, look at what's coming towards us. And he says, I'm already starting to gather them for eternal life. And Jesus says, open your eyes. Open your eyes and look around you. And I'm gonna say that to us. I think we need to hear that. We often say, well, how can we change the world? I'm gonna change the world. I'm gonna get on social media and I'm gonna complain a lot. That will do it. <laughs> and I think Jesus would say, instead of trying to win an argument, why don't you go try to win a heart to me? 
Jesus is saying to all of us, open your eyes. Do you know in 2017, the government did a study and one of the parts of the study in Rutherford County was how many people in Rutherford County go to any house of worship, not just a Christian house of worship, any. Hindu, Buddhist, Unitarian, Universalist, it doesn't matter, any kind of house of worship. How many people in Rutherford County go? 30%, that was in 2017. Christianity has declined rapidly since 2017, but in Rutherford County, we just think we're like hitting home runs all the time. We're probably much less than 30, maybe 25, maybe 22%. Now imagine if you get a 25 on a test. It's an F, guys. So we walk around and more than likely three out of four people that we come in contact with do not have a relationship with Jesus. And so Jesus is saying, open your eyes. There's a lot of lost people at your job, a lot of lost people at your school, a lot of lost people at the grocery store, a lot of lost people in your coffee shop. Get to work. Start building relationships and talking to these people and praying for the opportunities for God to put in front of us. They're already there, quite frankly, but that we need to be a little bit more bold and love people and share the truth with them. Now, here's the thing. We will not, ever, we, we will not always see the fruit of that labor. And, and quite frankly, we cannot change anybody. The Bible says we plant the seed, we water the seed, but it's God that makes things grow. Our job is just to plant and water. That's what we're called to do. And we may not see the fruit of that labor. On the flip side of that, we may see a lot of fruit that we didn't labor for. There may, there may be people who come into this church, get baptized, but man, there was a praying mother for 20 years behind that. There was a student pastor from another state behind that. And we just get to see the fruit of that. The point is this, we are not in competition. My God, eternity is way too big of a deal. And you Christians who keep nitpicking everything that every other Christian does, stop it. Unless it's heresy, be quiet. I am so, I, and it's not anyone from this church or from this area. I was on Facebook the other day, I don't know why, and there was someone <laughs> that wrote something super negative about the, the revival in Asbury. And I'm like, what would you rather these college students be doing? I mean, like, like having sex and doing drugs and all these other things that college students typically do, or would you rather them be praying for 14 days in the chapel? Give me a break. But, but here's the thing. Because it's not happening in my church, because, it's not hap because I'm not there, and it, listen, there's always going to be looky-loos and people who are going to ruin stuff. Humans do a fantastic job of ruining stuff, but that doesn't take away from the fact that this is a positive thing. Why in the world? Eternity is way too important for us to constantly be nitpicking at our brothers and sisters. Now, many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of what the woman said. When she testified, he told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. Many more believed because of what he said. And they told the woman, we no longer believe because of what you said, since we have heard ourselves and know that this really is the savior of the world. So most people in town knew this woman. Imagine, 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 imagine. If, if a woman who had the worst reputation in town ran in, she's excited, something has happened to her. There is this obvious change. Something has, and she is just giddy. You have to come meet this man. You have to come meet this man. So they were intrigued and they wanted answers. And what we learn is this. When people see the fruit of God working in our lives, they're going to be curious. When people see love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, here's a good one, self-control, when they see us living those things out, they're going to go, what's the trick? What are you doing? How do you have this kind of peace and contentment and joy? Why does your marriage look like, like, like so good? And why are your kids, why is your relationship with your children so good? Why? And then that opens up the door for us to tell them why. And so our personal testimonies are huge. No one in that town would have known that the Savior was right out there by the well if this woman hadn't shared her testimony. This is another big push. You, listen, guys, 
You can't go arguing the Bible with a bunch of people who don't believe in the Bible. It doesn't work. Hey, you know what the Bible says about that? I don't believe in the Bible. There's no, there, you can't do that. But if you get to know people, it's a novel ideal. If you get to know people and they start to trust you and you can tell them about how God has changed you, then the door is open for them to say, well, tell me more. Well, let me show you. But we have to lead with a personal testimony. That's why it says in Revelation that they overcame the devil by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. Now, eventually, the truth in that testimony became the individual's truth. The woman came in, and first they believed because of her, but then they walked up. I love this. And they say, we no longer believe in Jesus because of what you said. We believe because we have heard the truth ourselves. Amen. Do you know what that means? You cannot get to heaven just because you grew up in a Christian home. You cannot get to heaven just because your parents are Christians or because your, your wife is a Christian. You must have a personal revelation of who Jesus is. We must have a personal revelation of who Jesus is. And our testimonies will help others develop a testimony as well. Let's go back to this woman at the well. The first thing is this. Let's pretend like we are the woman at the well because all of us have been. We must take responsibility for our actions. I do not care what society tells you. There are always consequences to our actions. And so we have to own the fact that we have done things that are evil. Not only do we have to take responsibility for what we've done, we also have to take responsibility for a personal relationship with Jesus. But Corey, a pastor hurt my feelings one time. Okay. That when we stand in front of Jesus Christ and have it, last week's lesson and have to give an account for how we lived and Jesus says, why didn't you have a relationship with me? Because oh, my parents were mean. Because that pastor hurt my feelings one time. And that's not, guys, that's not gonna hold water, man. We are responsible for our personal relationship with Jesus Christ and for our actions. We must also acknowledge that we need to be saved. We must acknowledge that we cannot do it on our own. We must also learn to feel remorse for sin. Well, Corey, one time I repented 15 years ago. You have done sin in the meantime, and it's time to repent again. Repentance should be a lifestyle. I don't just make mistakes in my relationship with my wife and say sorry one time. Every time I do something that hurts her, I say I'm so sorry for that. That doesn't mean I'm worried about my marriage ending. It means that I love her and I wanna make sure that I honor her. Corey, are you saying we can lose our salvation every time we sin? I'm not saying that. I'm saying that if you truly love Jesus, every time you do something that hurts him or offends him or is rebellious to him, if you say you love him, you should say you're sorry. And you should not want to do those things anymore. But we also have to believe that Jesus has a better way for us. And I think that the, the crux of the matter is we say things like that, but I don't know if we really believe things like that. That Jesus has a better pathway for us. And then the other thing we have to do is we have to worship God appropriately. There's an inappropriate way to worship God according to the scriptures, yes. If we're not worshiping, worshiping him in a balance of spirit and truth, it is not the way he wants. He wants a balance of spirit and truth, head and heart. Right? Feelings and intellect, the spirit and the word. He wants both of those things for us. So let's talk about witnessing. That means going out and telling people about Jesus. How did Jesus do this? Let's, Jesus in, with the woman at the well gives us the perfect example of how we are to talk to the quote unquote worst of the worst. How did Jesus interact with, with what society said was the worst sinner? How did he interact with someone that was just detestable by society's standards. You know, nowadays we don't, nowadays we don't really think anything is detestable. But, but let's take it somewhere uncomfortable because that's what we're talking about today. How does one minister to a racist? We've even made it in Christianity to where it's okay to, 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 to hate certain people. It's okay to hate racists, we say in our society. It's okay to hate misogynists. It's okay in our society. It's okay to hate people on these extremes, but, but listen, if the Bible is correct and that God does not want anyone to perish in hell for eternity, how do we even minister to the lowest of the low? 
Well, let's look at how Jesus did it. You know what the first thing he did was? He was friendly. Man, I wanna tell you, if you wanna change the world upside down, be nice. Be nice. Jesus was friendly. He also asked questions. You know what happens when you ask people questions? You start to get empathy for their situation. Doesn't mean you agree with it. Doesn't mean you think it's okay. But you start to understand why someone went down the road they went down. I have a really good friend several years ago sat in my office and was making a life decision that I thought was really, really not a good decision. It's not biblical. It wasn't good for for this individual, for, for his family. It was just not a good decision. And we sat in my office and this individual told me how they ended up in this place. And without going into graphic detail, they were sexually abused virtually every single day their entire life all the way to their adulthood. Now, I do not agree with what this individual was going to do with his life, but after you ask some questions and hear, you step back and go, I can see why he went down this path. I don't agree with it, but I, but I have some empathy for it. We ask questions. We listen to people. We show genuine concern. Jesus was honest. He emphasized that no matter how bad the sin is, we can be forgiven, that we can be changed, that we can be saved. And another thing Jesus did is he explained the scripture. That's impossible to do if we do not read the scripture. So you know what Jesus did? He looked beyond race. I should have made, we should have made just vats of green tea. Given all of you green tea, we could sit on the floor and we could just meditate on this next point. You ready? (laughs) Jesus looked beyond race. He looked beyond gender. He looked beyond politics. And he looked beyond failures to see a person. Think about it for a second. 2024, we hit another election year. And you know what Christians do in election years? They show their butts. <laughs> Jesus looked beyond sin. He looked beyond politics. He looked beyond color. He looked beyond failures. He looked beyond everything, and he saw a woman that needed to be saved. And we need to pray that God gives us the eyes to look beyond ideological differences racial differences, geographical differences, gender differences, and then we look past all those things and we see a human that needs Christ. I pray that God gives us those kinds of eyes. But for people to see the change, listen, this is also very important, for people to see the change that God has done in us, you actually have to hang out with people who don't know Jesus. That means the Christian bubble is not biblical. That means that only hanging out with people that think and look and act like us is not biblical. If Jesus did that, no one would get saved. Listen, that doesn't mean we condone what others do. That doesn't mean you like go meet a dude at a strip joint for lunch, right? That's not what this means. I don't know if they do that or not. If you do, I've caught you. <laughs> Anyways, it doesn't mean that we go to places we shouldn't go, do things we shouldn't do, or condone sinful actions. That's not what that means. But it means that we get out of our comfort zone and maybe we do have lunch with someone that has very differing ideological, philosophical, religious, theological views than we do, and we just start to build a relationship that we love them. And if we love them and if they will start to trust us, then we can introduce the truth into their life. Is that uncomfortable? Yes, it's uncomfortable. It's extremely uncomfortable at times. This is heaven and hell, though, brothers and sisters. And we need to get over what people think of us. If we're sitting at a coffee shop and someone walks in, I can't believe the pastor's talking to that person. If you ever do that, then I know that I'm probably going the right direction. And we need to make sure that we are out of our comfort zones. We do not condone sinful things, but we have to build relationships with sinful people. So let me ask you this. Are you and I honest and remorseful when we sin? Are we confessing our faults one to another, as the Bible says? Are we honest with God about it? Are we transparent with God? Do we own up to the fact that we have done evil things 
Do we truly believe that God's ways are superior to ours? And if we say, yes, amen, Corey, then why do we put so much time, energy, and money into things that the Bible says is going to pass? I'm not against you having nice things. I'm not against you going on vacations or having cool cars or living in it. I'm not against any of that stuff. But we are to seek first the kingdom of God because his way is superior. And then Jesus says, everything is added unto you. But do we honestly think that God's way is the best? Do we love people? Of course I do, Corey. I have a thing in my kitchen that says, love God, love people. (laughs) Bought it at Hobby Lobby. Of course I believe that. I'll ask you that question again in the middle of election season next year. Do you love all people? Corey, you have no idea how bad they are. No one knows how bad you are. Praise God that no one sees the dark chambers of my heart or yours. Do you know what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6? It gives us a list of all these people who will not inherit the kingdom of God. And we quickly look at that list and we say, that's right. Go get them. Those people, those people, those people. Do you know what the next verse says? And such were some of you. Praise God that someone got out of their comfort zones to talk to us. Praise God that someone didn't look at me as a a political view. Someone didn't look at me with all my sin. Someone didn't look at me just on the outside appearance, but someone saw me as a human. Praise God for that. Praise God that someone saw you as a person. And we have to go out into this world and we have to get past all the minors. We have to get past all the symptoms and we have to get to the heart of the problem is that most of the time people act the way they do because there is a disconnect from their creator and it is our job to do our best to connect the two. That's our job. So I'll ask the question one more time this morning. Are we willing to be uncomfortable? The church should not be a comfortable place. It should be very, very uncomfortable. Are we willing to be vulnerable? Are we willing to confess? Are we willing to to be exposed, if you will, in front of God? Are we willing to be that? When Jesus says, you've had five husbands and you're sleeping with a guy right now that's not your husband. You're correct. I, I have sinned. Are we willing to be that uncomfortable? And then... Are we willing to go out into the world? And I pray that God gives us the eyes to where we don't see politics, we don't see ideologies, we don't see philosophical standpoints, we don't see gender, we don't see race, we don't see color, we don't see geography. We see that that is a person made in the image of God. And my job is to plant a seed or water the seed that you have planted. So God can give growth. Would you bow your heads with me, please?